What's up, everybody? How's everybody What's doing? Up? <laughs> Y'all are not going to want to miss this episode. Hollywood actress is a Unitarian. Who? A Hollywood actress, China McClain. China McClain. Never heard of her. Well, she's very famous. <laughs> if you watch House of Pain. Uh, if you watch some of Probably these why. Halloween movies she's been in, The Descendants. She's actually won three oh. awards. So. I've heard of The Descendants, so there you go. That's something, yeah. right? She's not a nobody. Okay. She's definitely not a nobody. Okay. Um, and you know what? Before we dive into critiquing her yeah. beliefs, which is Unitarianism, that's what mm. she espouses, um, I just want to say I'm glad to see someone in Hollywood who is talking theology, someone who's talking about the Bible. It's uh, it's better to have biblical conversations than just junk conversations, right? So that's true. Um, even though we're going to be offering uh, China some loving correction, I just want to commend her for being open with her faith in Hollywood. Good. That's not easy, right? It's not. not. So. There's only a couple other people uh, that I know that is open like that. Mm -hmm. And so I give all the props in the world to China, even though I don't know you, China. Sorry if you see this. Forgive me. Uh, but but keep doing what you're doing. Only change some things a little bit and and take our our review as a loving uh, not even a rebuke, but necessary, yeah. you know, not even necessarily a rebuke, but just, hey, these are some things that we see some issues with. Here's our reasons for doing that. And you're more than welcome on the show anytime you want. So that's right. We love that you love Jesus. Right. We just want you to come to understand that Jesus is fully God and co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So right. uh, we like like Tyler said, this is not a rebuke. Um uh, the distance between us and China is, is not uh, as far as some might think, but uh, we just want to offer some some of our thoughts because maybe she hasn't heard the Trinity explained uh, well enough or, or from right. script deep enough. So right. that's what we're going to be trying to do here. So what I'm going to do is jump right in. Um, I'm going to share my screen here and get her video up. It's um, it's not a super long video. Uh, she is is on here for about 12 minutes explaining why she thinks uh unitarianism is the is the best explanation of what's going on between the relationship mm -hmm. of the father and the son yeah. and we are going to offer a trinitarian review because on this show three crowns we believe the father is king of the universe the son is king of the universe the spirit is king of the universe and so we crown each one with three crowns amen Christianity is trinitarianism Let's jump right in. You ready, Tyler? So real quick, I do want to preface this by saying Dane is actually, so Dane's live reacting, right? Boo. I'm blind reacting. I Again, I've never heard of this girl. Dane brought this to my attention like five minutes ago. Mm -hmm. And we just said, hey, let's jump on and do a review of this now. So I have no idea what she's going to say. So this is just all off the cuff for me. So if I say something wrong, man, don't, don't hold it against me. Dane, lovingly correct me as I'm willing to be corrected. Um, so yeah. Let, let, I say that to say, let's jump into it. I don't know. What's I think it's coming. fun that you're going in totally blind to this because uh, I don't know what to expect. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get real off the cuff Tyler Fowler comments here. So uncensored. Uncensored. <laughs> Raw. Let's do it. Here, here we go. Hold on. Hold on, Dane. Stop it real quick. We need oh. to add this to the stream real there quick. There we go. Somebody's new to StreamYard. Somebody's very new to StreamYard. Young Padawan, you will get it one day, my friend. I just want to be a Jedi, man. That's all <laughs> I want to be. <laughs> in time, in time, young Padawan. Here we go. All right. People, specifically Christians, are going to take this video. But I just want you to hear me out. Consider what I'm saying, okay? I have recently okay. been led, honestly, much stronger than I've been led to do many other things in my life to look into the Trinity doctrine. Basically, it's a doctrine in Christianity that teaches that God is made up of three distinct persons. That Pause it. God... I don't like that language off the cuff. Made up of three... That almost sounds like partialism. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and it's going to get explicitly into partialism as the video goes on. Okay, and so just for those who might not know, who might be coming in from you know might never seen this video before whatever dan can you explain what what partialism is exactly yeah so partialism is is as if god is made up of three different parts that that together 
come together and and become one God. So it's almost like the Father is thirty three percent God, the Son is thirty three percent God, and the Spirit's thirty three percent God. Hmm. And that's that's why it's partial, right? Each one is partially making up the Godhead. Yeah. Um, whenever someone uses the example of a three leaf clover as a metaphor for the Trinity, my it's like nails on a chalkboard to me because I'm like that's partialism. Right. The the true doctrine of the Trinity that the church has always held forth and, and lifted up is that there's one God uh, and three persons of this Godhead and each person in the Godhead is fully God. So um, it's not that they come together to like puzzle pieces to make God up. Um, yeah. Each one on his own is fully God. Right. And just to add to that. And so we let's just take the sun for the example. We would never say that the sun is somewhat God. The sun is 33 percent God, whatever. Right. Because the scriptures and all of our arguments tonight are going to come from scripture. Uh, Colossians 2, 9, uh, just the English Standard Version says for in him, in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And I know there's some translations that say the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily, things like that. Uh, but but given, I think modern translations are on point whenever it comes to this. I'm a big fan of the New King James Version now that I'm leaning uh, Eastern Orthodox. Also, the Eastern Orthodox New Testament is a translation that goes off the patristic uh, Greek text, and which is, I, I, I'm a big Greek nerd for those that don't know me, um, but I find uh, the Greek fan fascinating in the Eastern Orthodox Bible, uh, New Testament fascinating as well. Um, but but we'll see. So let's just see a couple more of these uh, passages here. Colossians 2, 9. Uh, the New American Standard says, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells uh, in bodily form. The Berean Standard Bible, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. And so you have this concept of in the... I was about to mess up about said person. In the body of Christ, right? We believe that Jesus existed before he pre-existed his incarnation, i.e. he added a human nature to his divine person, right? And we believe that in that body is everything that makes God God is within Christ, within that body that is Christ. So if we would want to separate Christ up into two distinct parts, not God up into two distinct parts, but the human Jesus Christ, we would say that, yes, he is fully God and fully man period in the subject dane yeah so um i'm taking my mind to john 1 1 which says in the yeah. beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god what's interesting is it doesn't say uh the word is part of god right or god is made up of father and the word it actually just says there's god and then there's this word who is also god or the word and, is a god or the, right. well Not that there. would be yeah that would be a, a faulty translation, wouldn't Polytheism. it? Polytheism. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, yes, the fullness of deity dwells in Christ bodily. Um, Paul talks about how God is made manifest in the flesh through Christ. And John, of course, says that the word is God. So it's not a, a red flag to look for when people are talking about the Trinity is if they use the word made up of mm -hmm. because God is is one, you know, mm -hmm. and so you're probably going to slip into partialism as soon as you use that phrase made up of. Yeah. And then another red flag is to, is to note manifestation, right? God has three manifestations. That would be maybe something that slips into kind of a oneness Pentecostal thing. So right. the, the language you want to hear is one God, three persons um, right. without made up or without the word manifestation. So right. let's, uh, let's keep plugging away. Yeah. Whole God together each hold the title of God in front of their oh. name, God, the father, God, the son, and God, the Holy spirit. And the three of them are what make God, God. They are all three co-equal. There's no hierarchy or anything like that. All of them are completely equal. They just have different roles. Pause it. So I kind of take issue with that. So for those that, and again, I do not represent the Orthodox church at all. I am a catechumen. I am not a priest. I am not even a full member, okay? What I have been doing is studying these issues, and so I can give my opinion, I believe, on what I understand orthodoxy to be teaching. But if I say something that's wrong, please go and double-check with your priest if you are orthodox 
Uh, if you don't, don't do not take what I say with any kind of uh, authority or anything like that. Double check what I say with your priest. Um, but what I would say here is no hierarchy. I, I find issue with that uh, from an orthodox perspective. And I know, Dane, even though not being orthodox, you've studied this issue. So what we would hold to is the concept or what I personally hold to is this concept of the monarchy of the father. It's um, in a sense, we would say that Jesus Christ, the son, is not in essence subject to the father, but in his role. And we explained this on last week's episode, Dane, about there's this understanding that, um, oh, how does that go? I said it over and over again. Um, but basically, because you have a different function, before you, because you act differently uh, within the Godhead we're talking about, there's three persons, because the Son does something different, does not make him less of divinity than, than God the Father. What we do understand is that the Son does obey the Father. There is this understanding that the Son is begotten from the Father and not the other way around, just like the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, as the Nicene Creed says. And so the the basics, what I'm trying to get at here, is there is a hierarchy within the Trinity itself, within the Godhead. But again, that doesn't make the Son or the Spirit any less God because they function differently. Dane, is there anything that you'd like to add to that? Yeah, so there's no there's no issue with a hierarchy amongst equals. Mm -mm. And we got to get that in our heads. There's no issue with a hierarchy amongst equals and we get this in a school building. The principal is higher than the teacher. The teacher is higher than the student. And yet whether you're talking about the principal, the teacher or the student, all are equally human. And so when we talk about Christ being equal with God and equal with the Father, that is biblical language. It's straight out of Philippians 2.6. It says that um, Christ being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So Christ is equal with the Father. That's biblical language. You cannot deny it. Christ is equal with the Father. But this doesn't mean there's not a hierarchy within the Godhead. And that doesn't diminish the equality of essence or nature. That doesn't diminish the full divinity of Christ or the spirit. It just means that they have different uh, roles. And when you take it even deeper, it does go deeper than roles in that the father is unbegotten and the son is begotten. And so there's this eternal cause and effect, right? And, mm -hmm. and so my, I have no issue saying there's a hierarchy in the Godhead, and that doesn't diminish the equality of the three persons in the Godhead. So mm. that's one that's one way I would look at that. There's an article that I just pulled up, Dane. Um, it's by uh, <sighs> Professor Dr. Stefan B-U-C-H-I-U. I, I don't even know how to pronounce that. But he is the professor of systematic theology and dean of the theological factory or faculty, excuse me, at the University of Bucharest. And so, what I'll do is I'll send Dane, or I'll I'll add it to uh, uh, the description of this video if you'd like to do some more reading on the monarchy of the Father from an Orthodox. Uh, he looks like a priest, um, or or maybe even a bishop. Uh, but anyway, uh, also I would recommend uh, the video that we did on faith unaltered. Uh, with Dr. Bo, Bo Branson. Uh, we had a discussion uh, with our old co-host, uh, Dell uh, Glover, and we had a good discussion about the monarchy of the Father. And I think Dr. Branson did an extremely, extremely good job of, uh, of laying that out. Also, uh, if you visit Bo Branson, I think it's bobranson.com. Um, he has a video series that I'll also link into the description uh, that he has a whole series teaching on this subject. And again, he's the guy that we invited onto the show to give an episode uh, about an hour and a half, two hours, I think it was, um, all, on the subject. So I'll, I'll put all these links in the description uh, for anyone that's interested. Cool. All right. Awesome. Under the Godhead. The doctrine says the three of them make up one God. So 
the Bible makes it very clear in John 1 that Jesus is the word. He is the word of God made flesh. I want to hold on. (laughs) <laughs> back oh. up 13 verses exactly that was going to be my point we can't start at verse 14 no we have, we have missed so much by skipping yes. over verses one two three four and so on um i'm going to let her finish her thought and then we'll talk about john one in more depth go ahead to come down to earth and be the lamb be the sacrifice for us to pay the wages of our sin on the cross jesus walked in that in literally everything he did and said he walked like he was an extension of God. Okay, so I agree with that. She last says statement. she says he walked as though he was an extension of God, and I know what she means by that. But again, if she had started with John one one, in the mm-hmm. beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then John two, he was in the beginning with God, and then John three. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that has been made. So right there we have that this word is called God, but in a different sense than the Father is called God, right? And if we keep going to verse 18, I know I've just skipped over several verses too, but then we will see that um, the Son is called the only begotten God who has made the father known to us. Right. And so there's this sense in which John one is trying to explain to us the co-equality of the father and the Mm -hmm. son, Mm -hmm. how the son is begotten of the father and how the son is the one who is the word who takes on flesh. And so they are both expressed as being fully God. So while, while we could talk about this language of, Christ being an extension of the Father, I think it's much more biblical to talk about him as either the image of the Father or as the only begotten of the Father. I think that's a lot more precise than calling him an extension of the Father. Yeah, and I I think, you know, I, I said it before, and I still, to a point, agree with what she says by that. But if she's coming at this from the understanding of a Sabellian doctrine, which means like a oneness Pentecostal position or even an Arian position, uh, you, you still have to deal. I don't, it's fine to take John 1 14 into consideration, but let us not just look at the passage and, and let's just forget about going up for a second. I think Dane did, did a really good job of explaining what was above verse 14, but let's just keep, let's continue. I think she was using the new King James version. Good job. Um, but let's let's look at what else John 1 says. So verse 15, John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Well, what does that mean? John the Baptist or John the Forerunner was six months ahead of Jesus mm-hmm. or, or three months ahead of him. Um, he was born before him. What does this mean? He was before me. We would say that he, John, I- even here, is acknowledging that Jesus existed before John the Forerunner. Uh, Verse 16, and his fullness, We uh, is there something you wanted to say about that passage, Dane? Well, so John's gospel is one of the ones that shows us the pre-existence of Christ the most, right? So it's not just John the Baptist who's going to say that, it's John the Apostle, uh, whom Jesus loved, who's going to say that in places like John 17, 5, Mm -hmm. when he quotes Jesus saying, um, uh, Father, glorify me with the glory... I shared with you before the worlds were made. So uh, John is also the apostle who's going to deliver us the citation of Jesus when he says, before Abraham was, I am. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of these uh, texts that prove and display the preexistence of Christ uh, in in the gospel of John. It starts in chapter one. It goes throughout the whole book, though. Mm -hmm. Um, No, I agree. And not only that, but the rest of the epistles, the rest of the gospels. I mean, oh, for sure. For sure. All John though is centered, I believe on the, you know, a more spiritual aspect and showing that Christ is God. But if we continue to verse 16, there's a lot of theology in these next three paths or three verses, excuse me. And of his fullness, we have, re- we have all received grace for grace for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son 
who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So a couple notes real quick, and then we'll move on. No one has seen God at any time. Dane and I uh, did uh, brought this up in our last video. By But, which guys and gals, check this out. Sean Griffin is actually coming on the show, what, Dane, tomorrow? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. So <laughs> Wednesday, uh, I we'd have to check and see the times, unless, Dane, you know it off the top. I forget what he said. Um, but Sean is coming on uh, tomorrow with us uh, to do a live discussion about the review video that we did of Sean and his debate with Matt Slick. But this is what we brought up in that video. No one has seen God at any time. Yet you have so many people, Old Testament saints, saying, have my eyes not seen God? Hagar, for example, Jacob says he wrestled with God. I've seen God face to face. What do you mean, John? No one has seen God at any time. Well, I sent Dane this very interesting text. It's, a, it's about a paragraph long uh, from the Orthodox Faith, which is a book written by Thomas Hopko. And let me just, uh, if I could, let me pull this up real quick because I think it's so relevant uh, to our discussion here. Oh, I had you pulled up. Hold on just a second. Um, but I told Dane, I said, dude, I never thought of this, like that. what I'm getting ready to say, like this before. And I always stopped at, well, maybe, you know, I, I, I understand that in the Old Testament theophanies, whenever we see God, we're seeing the sun. But I never took it a step farther. So listen to this, and y'all comment what you think about this uh, as well. So Father uh, Thomas Hopko says, In addition to this, it is also orthodox doctrine that the manifestation of God to the saints of the Old Testament, the so-called theophanies, which means divine manifestations, were manifestations of the Father by, through, and in his Son, or Logos. Thus, for example, the man manifestations to Moses, Elijah, or Elias, or Isaiah are mediated by God's divine and uncreated Son. Yes, people did see the Father, or, or I'm sorry, people did see the Son. What does John say in John 12? In Isaiah's vision in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through however many verses is in Isaiah 6. I forget off the top of my head. But there's this image. Isaiah is having a vision of the Lord of glory seated on his throne and the angels surround him. The seraphim are saying, holy, 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 the Lord God almighty, right? And John in John chapter 12 says this whom Isaiah is seeing is Jesus. Now, I never I, I, I stopped there. But think about what Jesus tells Philip in John chapter four, 14, right? He says, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. My question to China is what other creature can say that? What creature in, in, in general can say that? Not other creature because Jesus isn't a creature, right? But what creature can say, can you say, China, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? I can't. I don't think Dane would be so bold to say that he could. And I think the only person that would ever say that is God himself, the son. Sorry to rant there, but I just know that's that good. good. And John 14, 11 ties into what you're saying. Jesus right. says, believe me that I am in the father and the father is in me. That's right. So there's this sense in which the persons of the Trinity live in and through each other. Right. So mm -hmm. if you're seeing one member of the Trinity, you're seeing all of them. It's, it's another reason why Jesus talks about how, after he ascends, uh, he'll send the Holy Spirit, but also the Father and the Son will come and make their home in our heart. Well, they're doing that in and through the Spirit, right? That's right. So there's this sense in which when you see one member of the Trinity, you see them all, and that shows their total unity. And yet it would also be fair to say Isaiah saw Christ in a, if you're trying to be uh, you know, precise about the image he was seeing. Um, but... In that, in the unity of the Trinity, you see all three members at the same time. Right, Dan. I don't know if you can. You still hear me? Yeah. Okay. My mic got unplugged for just a second there, so I didn't know if it screwed anything up. But okay, go ahead. Well, unless I didn't hear you say something that I didn't hear you say, <laughs> but every I, I don't think, think I've heard you did. You I think I've heard <laughs> you say everything. All right, let's keep going with this. Um, and and y'all, just a quick pause. This really is one reason it's so important to not just believe the Bible, but to believe everything in the Bible. So we don't just start at John 1.14. We want to start at John 1.1. 1, 1. And I'm sure that China knows John 1.1. 1, 1. I'm sure she can quote it off the top of her head. 
So I'm not denying that she she doesn't know it or anything like that. My point is that she is the one who brought her audience right into verse 14, skipping over verses 1 through 13 and not showing them 15 through 18. And if you take the whole start of John's gospel, it's hard to get a Unitarian position out of that. It, and so never take verses in a vacuum. Um, take the whole flow of, of the Bible, not just verses that you're snapping out as proof texts. And I think that that clashes with the Trinity doctrine in a very big way. Here's what Jesus said in John 14. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Yeah, so in the is incarnation... That, is that all she says about that? No, I'm sure she goes on. Oh, I okay, just, okay. I'm, I'm getting in front of the horse here. Yeah. Um, so in the incarnation... Jesus humbles himself, takes on the form of a servant, and becomes perfectly obedient to God the Father. That's in Philippians 2. But if you read Philippians 2, it says before he humbles himself in that way, he's equal with the Father. So, yes, in, in, his, uh, in his earthly incarnation, the Father is greater than him. He worships the Father because he is made fully man in the incarnation. So no issue with uh, Jesus saying... The Father is greater than I. Uh, as a human being, um, Jesus, of course, worships the Father, honors the Father, gives glory to the Father. So you got to keep in, in mind the incarnation. So many Unitarian arguments just forget about the humility of the incarnation. Mm -hmm. uh, so many Unitarian arguments uh, just, just act like time for Jesus starts, you know, when he's born of, of the Virgin. What's really interesting is... Um, when you, when you read Psalm 22, which is a messianic psalm prophesying Jesus, in Psalm 22, 10, it says, From my mother's womb you have been my God. That's when, when Jesus starts calling the Father God, is, is from the, the womb of Mary. Before that, it's this um, co-equality uh, at, a, at, a, at a more eternal level, I guess. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to add to that. I don't know if I worded that well, but... You well, have to remember the incarnation is a, is a moment of total humility for the Son of God. Yeah, I, I agree. And not only that, but John 14 is such the whole thing, again, not just isolating passages, but the entire thing, if you read it in context, and it seems to me like you can't walk away with anything but a Trinitarian concept. Right. You have the Holy Spirit that's specifically mentioned here whom Jesus says is another advocate, another paraclete. What? I thought there was only one, right? Go back to the Old Testament. There's only one Savior. There's only one comforter. There's only one paraclete, one helper that means something, right? And yet Jesus is calling the Holy Spirit another helper or another advocate or comforter, right? Not only this, but you have also, uh, let's see here. So let's just read 25. These things I have spoken to you, while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, I'm sorry, but I think Andrew Elliott does a really good job of showing that you cannot, and again, I don't know what China is, but you cannot get oneness, Pentecostalism, out of this passage. I, the, the helper, well, let's just read it like a oneness Pentecostal, but I, myself, whom I will send in my name, will teach you all things? It doesn't make sense to me. Um, so again, this is a problem of isolating one passage and not taking the context into consideration. Also, again, what does greater mean? China seems to be assuming this means greater in ontology, greater in being, greater than the sun in that sense. But keep in mind what I said earlier. Just because you have a different function, again, and this would practically line out to where Jesus is worshiping the Father, right? Just because Jesus does something different does not mean Jesus is any less God than God the Father is, or the Holy Spirit for that matter. So again, I just, I'd say that to keep pounding that in mind, or, or in, in your mind and in my mind and in Dane's mind, difference in function does not indicate superior or superiority of nature or, ah, man, I almost had it. That's that's the quote, I think. So 
we got it. I, I I'm, I'm going to figure that. Inferiority of nature. Inferiority of nature. Right. Go ahead. All right. After I looked into the doctrine and then I went back to this verse and read it, I saw a clear contradiction. Pause it. Pause it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we may be about to say the same thing. Go ahead. Don't go back to one verse. Yes. You nailed it. Don't you dare do that. That's where you get messed up. That's where things start breaking apart. I Again, I told Dane this the other day. I can go to one verse in the Old Testament and prove that, G, that God is a chicken. I can. I can go to one passage in the New Testament where Jesus talks about gathering uh, the, the church like a mother hen gathers her young, right? I can make God into a chicken if I do that. Don't do that. Good hermeneutics take not only the context, but the syntax, the grammar, all of that into consideration. Start at verse 1 and in at the last verse, and then keep going. If it's a book, go ahead. You know, you know who's a big fan of taking verses out of context is Satan. Hey, <sighs> if you're really the son of God, throw yourself off of this pinnacle, because it's written, he'll send his angels concerning you, that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus has to correct him and say, don't take that verse in a vacuum. You know, like you just said, you could turn God into a chicken with isolated verses. You could turn God into almost anything in isolated verses because there's so many metaphors used for God. It's like, is God a rock? Like, can we go find a specific rock on the planet and say that right. that's God? Well, clearly the clearly God is our rock is is meaning something different than just a, a wooden literal interpretation of that so yeah. we have to take all of scripture and as you mentioned chapter 14 is a highly trinitarian verse if you start at verse one jesus says believe in god believe also in me for for eternal life you have to believe in god and god's son yeah that's you know that's pretty pretty trinitarian by the way dane chapters my friend are not verses <laughs> Uh, did I misspeak? <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> you said chapter 14 is a Trinitarian verse. I was like, how do you get that, bud? But anyway, I figured somebody would say it in the comments, so I just went ahead and knocked that out of the park for him. I so. don't even have a bad excuse. I've drank plenty of coffee <laughs> today, so. Um, uh, that's um, fine. Uh, let's keep going. Yes, let's do the it. The Trinity Doctrine says that God the Father is not greater Pause. than God the Son or God the Holy Spirit. That's not true at all. Um Again, Monarchy of the Father, I, I encourage people to go uh, listen to it. And again, taking greater in what way? China, that's that's all I would ask at that point. Define what greater means, mm -hmm. okay? P period and subject. You can go yep. ahead. Uh, absolutely. By the way, my question real quick to China is, whenever you say that you, because it sounds like you're kind of doing this in the same day. Maybe I'm just assuming that. I don't know. But it kind of sounds that way. Like, I went and I looked up the Trinity Doctrine. And then I came back to this passage. It all seems relatively quick to me. Maybe not. Maybe not. But my question is, how long have you studied this? Or how long have you studied this doctrine for? Did you just Google search it and then come back? That's what many people do. I'm not accusing you of that, China. Like, don't take that the wrong way. But I'm just curious how long you actually studied this for. Um, because it's starting, like, these are common objections that people bring to the table and they've been answered over and over and over again by not only Protestant Christians, but Orthodox Christians and Catholic Christians as well. So, yep. And one thing to keep in mind when someone says, I've been studying this, mm -hmm. and I don't know what China has or hasn't done here. So, I'm not accusing her of anything. This is more just in general. But when someone says, I've studied this, does that just mean you and your Bible and your Google machine? Or does it mean you've been talking to pastors? Does it mean you've been talking to elders of the church? Does it mean you've been looking at church history and the councils and canons of, uh, of all the different councils? Um, so that's important to think about as well, because so many people, when they say, I've studied this, they really just mean me and my Bible and Google, or me and my Bible and one YouTube video I saw. And really, I encourage people go to a local church with a flesh and bone pastor, talk to them about it, go to a parish that takes church history seriously, where, yeah. where you're, you're going to be able to hear what the church has said to these kind of things. So uh, studying needs to be more than just me and my Bible and me and my Google. Uh, that's, that's a way that all sorts of crazy theologies have popped up over the last 500 years. And get both sides. Yeah. of the argument 
Do not just listen to your side, the one that you agree with now, and look for ammo to blast Trinitarians with, right? Like, right. I, I say this to everybody. Uh, I made that mistake whenever I was studying Calvinism. I would only listen to the Calvinist guys, and I wouldn't take the Arminian guys into consideration. And now, after doing that, I've completely flip-flopped and got completely out of Protestantism, okay? So that's what I'm saying, is study both sides of the subject. And I can tell, and I'm not saying this to be mean, I'm just, again, a, a loving correction. I can tell China has not done that because of the uh, objections that she's bringing to the table already. These have been answered. Over and over again, if you want a really good resource to go to, uh, modern resource, Andrew Elliott does a great job of discussing uh, the oneness Pentecostal position. If you don't like that, then I recommend Three Crowns uh, because we're going to hit on everything. And, and whenever I jump off here as co-host, Dane's going to take this and this is going to be Trinitarian apologetic based. And so come to Three Crowns, get subscribed because more Trinity content is coming your way but here's my other recommendation china and this is for china this is for everybody else please 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 go read john of damascus an exposition of the orthodox faith just go read it and, and you tell me now granted yeah it's in the year 700s but but this is uh, the the exposition of the orthodox faith i believe is the essence of of orthodoxy in general, but just read and listen to what some of these guys or this guy says about the Trinity. Then take that and go listen to or read John Chrysostom's homilies on John. The doctrines here, it's been here for 2000 years and it's not going anywhere. Arianism tried to defeat it back in the 300s. They failed. Sabellianism tried to defeat it back before that in the 200s. They failed. Trinitarianism, it's not going anywhere, y'all. Because... So. Because it's because the truth. It's the truth, and because Christianity is Trinitarianism. Amen. That's what it is. And uh, one one more book plug from yeah. the early church: Augustine de Trinitate. Uh, that's a that's a must. All right, let's keep going. Holy Spirit. They just have different roles, but Jesus just said, "My Father is greater than I." I think we have two options here. Now we can either take what Jesus said and try and interpret it and make it make sense to fit the trinity doctrine or we could reject anything that contradicts what came out of jesus pause false dichotomy, false dichotomy. <laughs> oh man she's assuming she's doing the same thing that she's warning people not to do and that's taking her theology and reading it in what jesus actually said again Difference in function does not indicate inferiority of nature. Bam, I got it. Yeah, you got it right that time. And, yep. and you know, um, a lazy Trinitarian apologist could actually do the same thing she's doing. Yep. John 10 30, it says, The Father and I are one. That boom, end of subject. Don't make anything contradict what Jesus is saying here. And and listen, if a Trinitarian apologist did that, I would agree. I would actually agree, but I'd say you're being lazy because it's it's more nuanced than that. It's it's actually a a trickier um, topic than that. And That's so right. again, all of scripture, all of scripture, all of scripture, we have to understand everything that the Bible says and piece it together. So it's not just piecing together. Jesus saying the father is greater than I, we also have to piece together Thomas falling at his feet and saying, my Lord and my God, Paul right. calling him the blessed God, Peter calling him the God and savior. He receives worship. He receives prayer. He forgives sins. We have to piece all these things together and then say, okay, with all this other stuff in the scriptures, what do we think Jesus means by the Father is greater than I? Right. And I think it has much to do with, uh, on, the, on the basic level that all Christians agree on, it has to do with the incarnation and his humility. Yep. And then in the Orthodox perspective, you add in the monarchy of the Father, and that is another, uh, that also has great explanatory power. Mm -hmm. um, so... Those are both both excellent rebuttals to what she's saying here. His mouth. Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son Pause. of Man, then so Notice how she's skipping around the verses. Yeah. That, that's what I want to point out just real quick, is that she's got her proof text, they're locked and loaded, and now they're coming at us, right? Yeah. And my thing is that, again, that shows me, just off the cuff, that she's not studied this issue genuinely, because again, 
if there was an actual argument here, I think, and now Dane, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe I'm, I'm just being presumptuous here, but it wouldn't be shotgun Bible verses. It would be arguments, not just, let's just read what Jesus says. Right. That's, yeah. That's I, I think that you're right. And I think that it's, it's very telling when someone jumps from one place to the next without actually expositing the verse and the surrounding context. See, she really didn't even, uh, she really didn't even exposit no any of, of this John 1 14 or nope. John 14 um, and and she's just breezing through it saying look that's what it says um, if we but you and I have brought in the surrounding context of John 1 we've brought in the surrounding context of John 14 and yep. here we'll, we'll end up bringing in the surrounding context of John 8 so again verses and vacuums don't help anybody's case agreed. And you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself, but as my father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. All right. Check this out. That's such a beautifully Trinitarian verse. Uh, the father and the yeah. son are in complete harmony. Jesus only speaks that which the father gives him to speak. Uh, in his in his teaching, um, the Father never abandons him, and Christ does only that which pleases the Father. Now, I would challenge China to name a mere creature who only and always does the things that please God. Right. That is moral perfection. That is sinlessness. Yep. That is absolute purity, and. <laughs> Only God is holy in such a way. In fact, um, what Jesus just said there is a proof that he is God because only mm -hmm. God can be morally perfect from start to finish, um, you know, or, or eternally in God's case. And uh, so that's that's one thing I would say. Another thing I would say is when Jesus says you have to believe that I am he, in the context of John 8, he's talking about believing that he's the Messiah, Right. When he says I am arguably, he, I think he's I think that he's saying you have to believe I'm the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So let's ask this question. Who do the prophets say the Messiah will be? Mm. Because we could go to Isaiah 9, 6 that says unto us, a son is born unto us, a child is given and authority will rest upon his shoulders and he will be called. Wonderful counselor. Mighty God, God the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Now, I don't want. To everlasting ever, father everlasting father i don't want anybody to ever go around saying um well mighty god is is a title that a human can share with the almighty god no no nope, that's exclusive that's what? an exclusive title what and human then, what human could say that what mere human could say that then you have um jeremiah i think it's 23 5 and 6 that hmm. the messiah will be called check this out his name will be yahweh our righteousness yep now, no mere human can take that title. You have Micah 5 2 that says the, the one who is born ruler over Israel is uh, like the ancient of days. So that's talking about his pre existence and his eternality. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Psalm 45 6, where God speaking about his Messiah says, um, uh, Your throne, O God, endures forever. So we start piecing. Oh, how could we forget Daniel? seven that thrones are set up for the ancient of days and the son of man the messiah and they sit upon these thrones and the father says all dominion all power all authority it's all yours mm -hmm. so the point i'm getting at is when jesus says you have to believe he's the messiah that should make us pause and say okay well who is the messiah uh like what are we supposed to believe about him and we go read the old testament and it's fascinating we're going to find out the messiah is going to be fully human and fully divine so anyway, the, the fact that he says you have to believe he's the Messiah, that's attached with the fact that you have to believe he's God. So I'll just add one little quick note, as I agree with everything that Dane just said. Um, the, the reason I said arguably at the very beginning, whenever Dane started talking, that this passage is talking about the Messiah, is because actually he is not in the Greek. I'm looking at it right now. Uh, it's Ego Me. And we all know, and, and maybe China does know this, maybe she doesn't know this, but this is the divine name of Yahweh. I am who I am. I am what I am, or I am what I will be, right? 
and and it translates back to now you've got to go through isaiah back to exodus to understand this if uh and again i'm going to recommend this because i think that this book explains it very well a couple people got a little eh, with me last time uh that i would ever recommend this book but i think james white does a good job of explaining the trinity in the forgotten trinity look at dane he's running off he's like i can't i can't do this um oh there it is right there look at that and so even though i disagree with dr white on multiple things <laughs> Um, I think the book, The Forgotten Trinity, is a great introduction book to showing not only Jesus' divinity, but giving a concept of the Trinitarian doctrine itself. You can take and now build off of that, right, into things like Monarchy of the Father, for example, right? But, but as a starting point, I think China, if you have not got this book, you need to get it, read it, and then take that and build off of it from there that's that's all i gotta say absolutely i fully endorse the forgotten trinity it's a great book yeah so all right let's see if we can keep going now yep. it doesn't get much clearer to me pause the father is great <laughs> i'm sorry i don't mean to keep doing that but again whenever she says stuff like that she's just reading in her preconceived notions we say the exact same thing dane we say how could they miss this right it's because we're taking our ideas and our doctrines into the text right now we believe the difference is we've exegeted them from the text but she would say the same thing right the only problem is we're exegeting she's not so that's what i would ask china to do is don't just it clearly says it right because people have been misinterpreting the bible for years hint, hint that's how protestantism got as far as it did i, I rest my case but but i say this is please the argument, it's clear, just throw that out the door. Because if you're going to actually make a statement about Scripture, you need to exegete it. Yeah, and dude, whenever she says it's clear, period, end of subject, this <laughs> to proof... To who? Yeah, well, <laughs> well you're, you're actually... She's not trying to do this, so I'm not accusing her of this, but there's an implication that the Holy Spirit has darkened the minds of the church for thousands of years. Right. Uh, and and that seems really, really strange because... That's a good the church, point. The church has proclaimed the Trinity since it's a, since, since the very it's beginning. Inception. That's right. Inception, which means it, if, if it's so clear that the Trinity is wrong, then why didn't the Holy Spirit teach us that from the beginning? Why did he allow our minds to be so darkened? And of course, the reality is the Trinity is true. And the Holy Spirit has actually enlightened us and given us clarity about that. And the irony would be that China's position is the one that is unclear. You know, there's a lot of people that bring this up doctrinally, but I think honestly, if if Satan got this pulled over the church, then literally the text in Matthew about the gates of hell not prevailing, I think it's Matthew 16, would I think that would apply to this because you're right. I mean, if you go to a Catholic liturgy, a divine liturgy in the Orthodox Church, and I'm sure even a Lutheran uh, liturgical worship service, right? I can only speak from an Orthodox perspective, but the Orthodox tradition for 2,000 years now, our divine liturgy is the center of it is the Trinity. We say prayers to the Holy Spirit. We right. say prayers to the Father. We say prayers to the Son, right? We ask the saints to intercede for us, but to God, intercede to God on my behalf in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We say that three times to get all three. Uh, Father, have mercy. Son, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. Yeah. The Trinity is riddled in Orthodox liturgy. I mean, it's just seeping out of it like a peanut, sloppy peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I love it. Because because it's who God is. And so... Amen. So, of course, our worship is going to be saturated with that Trinitarian name and glory and honor is going to be lifted up to Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And so, yeah, I mean, it's the same, even though um, as a Methodist, even though it's not quite as much as the Orthodox in terms of just the pure saturation, right? Like, you're right. I mean, I've, I go to Orthodox services often because I like um, the Orthodox Church. Uh, and and so, so anyway... Um, there is that saturation of Father, Son, Holy Spirit all the time throughout the whole liturgy. But even in the Methodist Church, I mean, we do the Gloria Patri, uh, which is um, praise, uh, 
which is um, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Uh, we have the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So our worship is Trinitarianly saturated as well. So anyway, um, with that, I am going to keep rolling. Greater than the Son. If Jesus was just one third of God, how can... Pause, pause, pause. That's the partialism. So I told you at the beginning this was going to show up. She is saying, if Jesus is one third God, why is he going to talk like this and like that? Well, Jesus isn't one third God. The Father isn't one third God. The Spirit isn't one third God. Each one is 100% God. One thing to kind of clear your mind of is the doctrine of the Trinity is not a math problem. Uh, the, the Godhead transcends mathematics. So whenever you're trying to make the Trinity into a math problem, you're off to a bad start. Uh, the, and here's one way I look at it because some people say, well, well, that's illogical or whatever, but here's one way I look at it. If you're married, mm -hmm. like Tyler and I are both married. Do you love your wife, wife with all your heart? I wish I could say I did. Well, do you want to? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Do you want to love your children with all your heart? Yep. Do you want to love God with all your heart? Oh, yeah. Well, that's 300%. 100% for your wife, 100% for your children, 100% <laughs> for God, right? It's not a math problem. It's not a math problem. So it's the same with the Trinity. It's not that Jesus is one-third, uh, God the Father's one-third, and the Spirit's one-third. The Trinity's never taught that. The Trinity teaches each one is fully God, um, the same way you can love more than one person with all your heart, or at least aspire to. God can be fully God in three persons. Right. Right. Uh, Dane, God, I know. Oh, I know you got to run. Um, I can. Uh, let me get this pulled up real quick. But if if you got to run, I can take keep it going on my uh, end. So so we've got two options, I guess. We okay. could just you tell me we could just part two this because um, man, we got through less than three minutes and <laughs> we've been going for 53 minutes. So uh, I think we could easily part two this and I think we could part two, three, four and five it. I think we could. So let's let's maybe plan for that. Um, okay. How about we uh, how about we let it roll and get one more section of commentary in, and then we'll we'll wrap right. up. after. And that. you choose when to pause it. I won't pause it this time. All right, let's do it. Teach. God, the son, something. They have equal knowledge. What one knew, the other two would know. He also said, if I honor myself, Wait. my... What? Teach? What? She's going back to uh, that John 8 where Jesus says, the father taught me all these things. So again, there's a um, there's a misunderstanding of the incarnation. Sorry, when... I didn't mean to pause it. No, you're good. This is perfect. We'll, we'll wrap up with this and then we'll do a part two later. Okay. So... Of course, the Father and the Son share omniscience. They share all knowledge. But there is a legitimate emptying uh, of, of the Son when he takes on the, the incarnation. That's the language of Philippians 2, that he empties himself. And it seems like one of the ways that he empties himself is of um, that, that, I don't know what the right word would be, but... Um, that, that he isn't tapping into perhaps is one way to say it, the full omniscience that he shares with the father before the incarnation. Um, so there is a sense in which as a human, Jesus learns and grows in wisdom and in favor in the Lord. The gospel of Luke talks about that, but he empties himself of that willingly. And one metaphor I've, I've heard used before it's from the red pin logic guy. Uh, I think his name's Tim Burton, but I, I could have his name wrong. Great YouTube channel red pen logic. Um, but someone could have perfect vision and willingly blindfold themselves and no longer have access to that perfect vision. But it's not that they don't have that perfect vision. They just have to take that blindfold off. Boom. Perfect vision is back. Jesus is fully omniscient, but in some way, as he empties himself, it's as if that omniscience is blindfold, but he could take that blindfold off whenever he wants and uh, tap back into it whenever he wants. It's still his, uh, by nature. And we actually have a really great example of this, how Jesus empties himself of something and then uh, 
but then reveals that he still has access to it. That's at the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus emptied himself or veiled that divine light, that divine radiance that he has by nature. And then on the Mount of Transfiguration, he shows it. He taps back into it. And so it's as if it's as if a blindfold was over that radiant splendor. And then he takes the blindfold off to show Peter, James and John, Moses and Elijah. So um, just because Jesus veils or empties or however you want to phrase it, his full omniscience doesn't mean it's gone from him forever. It's just, again, part of the humility of the incarnation, part of that full experience of being fully human. So you're going to like this, China. And for those who just don't like what we're saying right now. I mean, I don't know if China doesn't like what we're saying or not. Maybe she's like, oh, yeah, I like this. Um, but I actually have a different answer than Dane on this one. And All right. so I agree with Dane. I agree with everything he says. Um, but I would say just looking at the Greek. So the Greek word that's translated as taught in this passage is uh, it comes from the word didasko, right? Or, or the dasko. If you're uh, if you're going to go with the modern pronunciation on that, sorry, I've been trying to learn modern pronunciation uh, so I can uh, read Greek in in divine liturgy uh, soon. Uh, so that would be that would be really fun. But it's uh, it's in the aorist, and none of that really matters. And and here's why I say that because this is the problem with English translations. Okay, they take a word which can mean different things, multiple different things, and the problem with English is that you can only slap one translation uh, or one meaning into what you're translating. Now, unless you want to put like parentheses or this or that, whatever, I don't see any Bibles that are like that though. Uh, but the word didasco, it can mean taught. It can also mean admonish and it can also mean instructed. And so I would just say, because China is taking this as God, the father taught Jesus something and Jesus learned it, for example, right? Now, you can go with what Dane said, which is fine. Or you can say, didasco in this context means instructed. I would take that approach as the father. And again, keep in mind, we're going to say it again. Difference in function does not indicate inferiority of nature, okay? Mm -hmm. If you instruct Jesus to do something, that takes out this idea of learning. That takes out this idea of of teaching as in I didn't know before, right? It's the learning thing. It takes out this whole aspect of learning. And so I just think it's poorly translated. And if I were to translate John, which is my next project, I've already got first John translated. And my next project is to go to the gospel of John. All right. See you brother. I'll close it out. Oh no. Uh, I was, I was saying cool. Uh, you oh. and John. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 My bad. I thought you said I, I got to go. Um, but that's, that's the way I would, I would come about this passage. Um, because of how language evolves over time and because it's that's a uh, genuine definition for the word didasco, I would just switch it up a little bit and say instructed. That takes all of the ambiguity out. And I mean, if you want to say, well, you're just reading your Trinity, Trinity theology into it. No, not really. Um, but I guess, yes, at the same time, too. But it, it's a simple mistrans or not mistranslation. But I would update it. I'll put it like that. It's a, just a translation choice that you wouldn't have done yourself. Yeah, right. I, I yeah, because of this kind of stuff right here, mm -hmm. I would just say, look, instructed doesn't it, it leaves out that ambiguity that, well, could he mean Jesus learned in this context? I think that's accurate because Luke later on or earlier on anyway, what does it say? It says that Jesus grew. It's either Luke right. or Matthew. It's Luke. Grew in yeah. wisdom and and what what's favor. the next word? Wisdom yeah. and favor. Wisdom yeah. and favor before God and man. And so keep in mind too. So that's not a problem for us because Jesus was one hundred percent man. And guess what? He nursed at his mama's breast. He went to school. I'm assuming, or, or mama and Joseph taught him. Right, Saint Mary and Saint Joseph. They taught him. Um. So yeah. In yep. one sense, Jesus learned. He learned to speak. He learned yeah. his maps. You know, he learned. Uh, Here's the thing. His prayer. Yeah. Just real quick. I'll say this. We all believe, I would hope, that we would say that whenever Jesus was capable of seeing Philip under the tree, again, don't leave that out, China, because you say, well, 
Jesus didn't know everything. Okay. How did Jesus, if Jesus is only human, how did Jesus know that Philip was, or, or Nathan, I'm sorry, Nathan was sitting under a fig tree contemplating Genesis, the, the, the ladder, the divine ladder, Jacob's ladder, you know, it, but we would all agree that the Holy Spirit is the one through whom Jesus, as a man who has emptied himself, as Dane so, so beautifully said a while ago, emptied himself of these, you know, powers, I guess we could say, the Holy, he's relying on the Holy Spirit to get him not only through the day, but to strengthen his relationship with God the Father, with us. Jesus is relying on his miraculous powers from the Holy Spirit because he emptied himself and took on our nature so he could suffer with us, so he could be crucified for us, right? I mean, this is just basic Trinitarian theology 101, y'all. Yep. And, and incarnational, yeah. Yeah, and incarnational, so not a well, problem uh, for us. Well, let's wrap up there, China. We will talk about you again. I think it's funny we only got through a fourth of a video that's in itself pretty short. but There's a lot to this doctrine, bro. There's a lot to say. So let's wrap up um, in this way. I will say this before we jump off here, before you give your closing spiel. Hold on. Yeah. Um, I will say check us out tomorrow. We're going to be talking to Sean Griffin again. Um, what time, Dane? Do you know what time that is? I can look. 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central. Is it really that late? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what the, my messages say. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Wednesday night is going to be really, yeah. really exciting to have Sean on. So y'all aren't going to want to miss it. Come yeah. and join us live. That's right. That's right. And check out uh, Faith Unaltered today. We're having a broadcast with Jordan oh, Hatfield. That's yesterday. Yesterday. Oh, I thought we were alive. I'm dumb. Yeah. yeah. Check that out. The show that we did yesterday yeah. Yeah. <laughs> with Jordan Hatfield on Ephesians one, go subscribe to uh, faith unaltered uh, CSG and be on the lookout for more three crowns every Tuesday night at six central. My man. All right. Take us out, Dane. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit, three we name thee. Though in essence only one, undivided God we claim thee. And adoring, we bend the knee while we own the mystery. This has been Three Crowns. God bless you all. Till next time.